Uh, this morning, it is my pleasure to have uh, Professor William Mitch, I call him Bill, who is a very devoted and accomplished environmental engineer. Um, he will be talking to us to, uh, today about what is in our water. Now, a couple of things about Bill. I have lunch with Bill quite a bit. He is very committed to the environment. You should ask him about it. His house is nearly off the grid, meaning that he heats his water through solar panels. Uh, he uses a wood pellet stove for heating his house. And he doesn't have any grass in front of his house because grass is bad for the environment and fertilizer. So he's fairly serious. So get ready to learn a lot about the environment, OK? Let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you, Anissa and Aaron, for organizing this. And thanks all to all of you for showing up on a Saturday morning. So a lot of people. Uh, and just in case you're curious, a lot of people get worried about solar thermal systems in Connecticut because we are so far north. But it does work. You might not get 100% of your energy in the winter, uh, but you still save a lot of money on electrical or however else you're heating your, uh, your hot water systems. And during the summer, you get so much energy, you actually have to dump heat. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're talking about what's in your water, and this is hopefully of interest to you, because after all, you're 70% water, and you are what you drink, so it's important to know what's in your water. So we're going to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, why we bother to treat water. And since most of you may not be familiar with how we treat water, we'll talk about the details of both drinking water and wastewater treatment. Not too detailed, because after all, we only have an hour, but the, the basic points. And then we'll talk about some of the emerging issues that are important to uh, both Connecticut and the world. Uh, and talk about, of course, bottled water, because that's always an issue. And finally, talk about some of the issues in the developing world and what's going on here at Yale. So first of all, why do we treat water? Well, the, the obvious question for treating water is we don't want to get sick. And so the question is, is what makes us sick? Uh, and some of these things you're not familiar with anymore, because luckily we treat water, and you don't tend to get sick from some of these organisms anymore, but they are still problematic in many parts of the world. So there are four basic categories of pathogens. The first one is helminths, also known as worms. And examples of these include hookworm and ascaris, which is also commonly known as roundworm. Uh, here's a, a blown up version of a hookworm. And these are ascaris worms coming out of a pig intestine. So maybe, sorry about that if you're still eating your donut. Uh, <laughs> but what you actually swallow would be a worm egg, which is much smaller than, than these, which can get up to about three feet long. Uh, there are about 60 microns, which to put it in perspective, a sand grain is about a millimeter, about 20 times bigger than this. But it goes into your body and grows into a full-size worm. About an order of magnitude smaller are amoeba, and some of you have heard of this, cryptosporidium. Uh, another example is giardia. Cryptosporidium, there was an outbreak in Milwaukee in the uh, early 90s, and they, the uh, eggs, the oocysts as they call them, tend to hang out in cow pies. Here's a, a blown up version, sort of an artist's rendition of an oocyst in an intestine emerging from uh, the organism emerging from the egg. The most common pathogenic organism tends to be bacteria, even smaller than amoeba. And these are responsible for such diseases as typhoid and cholera. And they can come in a variety of shapes, but here are some pictures of, of some. And lastly, uh, viruses, uh, about 20 or 50 times smaller than bacteria. And they're responsible for diseases such as polio, which we used to have a lot of outbreaks up until about the 1950s in the US. And Norwalk virus, which is still with us and is the sickness that's responsible on cruise ships. When you hear about the Princess Cruise Lines and these sort of sicknesses that break out, that tends to be Norwalk or Khaleesi virus. And the reason why pathogens are a problem, they might not have been a problem in uh, hunter-gatherer times, for example. The real issue is population density. When we start crowding people together, it's difficult to escape our own waste. Example of that, here's a village right outside Angkor Wat in Cambodia. This is the town drinking water well. And here's sort of a cesspool around the well. So all this material penetrates down into the drinking water supply. Um, and so again, we're in exponential growth phase in population. So worldwide, public health becomes a very important issue. So again, here's that same picture of Cambodia. But this used to be the picture in places like New York and London back in the 1800s. So up here is a picture of Five Points, which uh, starred in that movie Gangs in New York. But right over here is the drinking water well. These are dirt streets. 
And it looks pretty clean here, but the reality is it was probably looked more like this. Uh, in London, back in the 1800s, houses were designed. Here's the floor of a house. Here's the road. People would generally just throw their sewage out in the road or throw it under the house in the crawl space. Uh, and the reason why they do that is because the waste product was known as night soil, and it served as a good fertilizer. So you send one of the kids down there to muck out the cesspool every once in a while. Uh, but the problem was is you have both hydrogen sulfide and methane, and the guy's going down there with a candle, so you'd have these explosions occasionally. So you might lose a kid. So it should come as no surprise that epidemics used to sweep through these New York and London and other major cities in about every 15 years, say, for New York in the 1800s. Nobody knew what bacteria were back then. Uh, they just called them miasmas. They often thought it was associated with the rotting trash piles out in the street. But they did have, uh, they didn't necessarily know what they were dealing with, but they knew enough to throw lime on walls. So if you're down in the basement apartment of a building, this material seeps through the walls, they'd apply lime, which raises the pH up to 12 and starts to kill off some of these bacteria. Uh, they didn't necessarily understand why, but it, it worked. But one of the, the sort of major events was something that happened in London called the Great Stink in 1858. So again, people were throwing their waste out in the streets or had rudimentary sewers to dump it in the Thames. And guess what's right on the Thames but Parliament? So people were, do, were doing this, and eventually the entire Thames backed up and started to rot. So you had this incident called the Great Stink. And most of the inhabitants fled, but Parliament was stuck in session. And of course, they were smelling this through the windows. So they authorized the construction of a major sewer. And it should point out that sewer comes from the old English for seaward. You're not actually treating the waste. You're just conveying it out to the ocean so you can get rid of it. So they built a major uh, uh, conduit to get rid of the sewage, which was the foundation for the Bakerloo tube line, if you go to London. And why was that? Because Queen Victoria was queen back then. This was a major engineering project. And she wanted to go check it out. But of course, she can't walk through. They didn't have sewage yet, but a, a dirty tunnel. Uh, so they built a little railroad car for her so she could go check out the sewer line. So what are some of the major treatment processes? Well, one of the first ones is fairly simple. It's been known since Mesopotamian times, first civilization back in 3000 BC. There are documents saying, well, if, to avoid being sick, get your pot of water and let it sit for several days so you can settle out particles. Pathogens tend to stick to particles, sand grains and other things, and some of them can be large enough to settle out themselves. And basically, it's just a giant box. You push your water or wastewater through the box, and particles settle out, and there are little scrapers that move it into a trough and convey it away. So since this is Science Saturday, we throw in one or two equations. Uh, but what we're, again, interested in is particle settling. And it turns out, I'm not going to derive this here, but particle settling tends to be proportional to the particle diameter squared. So it's highly dependent on the size of your organism. And again, remember that worms are about 60 microns and amoeba about 5 microns. And from this, you can calculate certain settling velocities. So engineering is about designing things that work. So I thought I'd just give you an example for how you might design something in New Haven using algebra. So again, algebra is useful. Uh, and what we want to do here is we'll have that box, that settling box here, and you flow your drinking water or wastewater through the box, and it's going to spend a certain amount of time there, but for 100% removal of a pathogen by settling, it's going to slowly sink as it goes through the box. So the, a, a pathogen at the top is going to need to sink a distance D within the time frame it, it travels through the box. So we need to know the resonance time of the material in the box, which is the volume, DLW, uh, divided by the flow rate. So cubic meters divided by cubic meters per second gives you time units. So that's a resonance time. So for 100% removal, our velocity has to equal the depth that has to sink divided by the time it has to, to accomplish this sinking. So we can simplify, and you get the flow rate divided by the surface area, so LW, so the, the top surface of, of the box, becomes the important parameter. So we can solve for various surface areas for New Haven to remove different types of pathogens. So we know this uh, settling velocity. We plug it into this equation. And we know the flow rate. There's, New Haven treats about 15 million gallons a day of either drinking water or wastewater, because what goes in goes out. And we can say. Well, what land area would we need to remove different pathogens just by settling for New Haven? 
And for worms, you'd need about half an acre. No problem. Readily done. Once you go down to amoeba, remember it's proportional to particle diameter squared, it ramps up rapidly. You're talking about 86 acres. That's a huge amount of land to set aside just for one treatment process. So basically it's not really going to work. And when you get down to even smaller particles, forget about it. It's not going to work at all. So what do you do then with those other uh, smaller organisms? Uh, you know, just as an aside, you know, one of the reasons we don't have worm contamination in the U.S. anymore is this is the most rudimentary treatment process. In the early 1900s, a lot of people started putting this in, and worms were no longer a problem. Well, another thing you could do is, say, to remove amoeba, is filter the system. And this gets into current EPA uh, mandates to try to require towns to actually filter their water. Most towns do, but cities like New York City don't. And New York City has issues uh, right now, and they're fighting it out with the EPA because, remember, cryptosporidium hangs out in cow pies, and their drinking water supply is up in the Catskills, and cows are farmed up there, so they're walking around and depositing cow pies in the drinking water supply, but the, the drinking water supply isn't filtered, and other treatment processes don't really get rid of cryptosporidium. So the EPA is trying to force New York to put in filters, but it costs about a billion dollars, so New York's trying to basically buy out the cows. So this can get rid of things like cryptosporidium, but viruses and bacteria can migrate through. So what does a filter look like? It's basically a bed in which you have sand. You dump water on top, and it slowly seeps down, is collected, and goes on to the next treatment process. And eventually, the filter clogs up, so you run water backwards, and you scrape off all the pathogens and wash it out to the sewer. So it's a pretty simple system, but when you start talking about millions of gallons a day, you start talking about some very expensive treatment processes. But the major treatment is disinfection, so chlorination. So uh, chlorine is essentially just Clorox. Uh, so you don't necessarily realize it, but a lot of you are essentially drinking Clorox, used to but obviously much lower concentration. So please do not do this at home. But it can come in different forms. The traditional form is just chlorine gas. And just to show you a little bit of chemistry, Chlorine gas are two chlorine atoms that tend to share their electrons, but when it hits water, it tends to split. So one of the uh, chlorines grabs both of the electrons in the bond and ends up as chloride, traditional table salt, completely harmless. The other one loses both of the electrons and combines with water and forms HOCl, hypochlorous acid, which is basically the constituent in Clorox. Well, chlorine likes electrons, and it's fighting with oxygen here, so it's unhappy. So it tends to be reactive and goes and tries to find two electrons elsewhere. And this is one option is to go after a pathogen. So free chlorine plus pathogen ends up being dead pathogen plus totally harmless chloride. So options for places like New York City are to either secure pristine water supply. So here's New York down here, and they've have uh, watersheds up here, the Croton watershed and the Catskills. Uh, and that works to a certain extent, but there are issues, as I mentioned, with cryptosporidium and filtration. Chlorine doesn't do a good job of, of getting rid of uh, cryptosporidium. But another option is to, for, uh, for viruses and bacteria, is to use chlorine. And just like to point out here, uh, I think it's an important point these days as we start talking about how to help the developing world that one of the major public health achievements came about not by medicine, but by environmental engineering. So here's a, a graph of typhoid cases in the US. You see fairly high numbers, but in the early 1900s, chlorination started happening to drinking water supplies, and you see a dramatic drop in typhoid cases as chlorination permeated out to smaller and smaller communities. It wasn't until the 1940s that penicillin came in, sort of a cure for some of these uh, antibiotics for pathogens. It's good, it's good to have these, of course, in case you get sick, but it doesn't do a whole lot of good to put all your money in medicine if the very next day you get cured, you go out and drink the same contaminated water supply. You just get sick again. So just to put together a basic scheme for drinking water treatment for surface waters, rivers, uh, lakes, you send it into a box, settle out particles, maybe run it through a filter to get rid of cryptosporidium, hit it with some chlorine, and you have a little... Uh, chlorine taste coming out of your tap so that it makes sure that you don't have pathogens growing in the drinking water distribution system as it goes out to you. If you happen to have groundwater, well, the ground is actually filtering 
the water supply in a sense. It's just basically a glorified sand filter. So all you really need to do is add a little chlorine and it comes to you. So another reason we treat water, uh, dissolved organics. It's not just about pathogens. So in pristine water supplies, we have something called humic substances. So if you go out to a lake or a river, you might see the water is actually brown in some cases. And what, what this comes from is leaves that rot over months to years into a highly varied polymer called humic substances. Highly degraded, very carbon rich. Microorganisms tend to pick out the nitrogen and phosphorus that they need to grow. Uh, and because it's been picked over for so long, the remnants aren't very bioavailable, so bacteria can't really eat it too well. Well, the problem with this material, besides perhaps it's unsightly, is that when you add chlorine, it reacts with this material because it doesn't know whether it's reacting with a microorganism or an organic. It just wants electrons. And you can form various byproducts. And so one of the byproducts it forms is chloroform. And you might see that. It's called trihalomethanes if you look at the drinking water report that might come to your house once a year. And people try to add various coagulants to group these molecules together and settle them out uh, in the settling tank or during filtration. The reason why this is important, these byproducts, is that they've been associated with bladder cancer. So bladder cancer tends to be, uh, I think it's the fourth or sixth most common uh, cancer in the U.S., 50,000 cases a year, 12,000 deaths. And there are epidemiology studies linking the consumption of chlorinated tap water and even swimming in chlorinated pools with bladder cancer. It's not the same risk level as, as smoking. We're not talking one out of three people ending up with cancer. But there are significant associations with consumption of tap water and bladder cancer. And they're thought to be associated with these byproducts. So there are efforts to limit these. Some other issues or looking at the other end of the, of the scheme, why do we treat wastewater? Well, again, we don't want to release pathogens or sediment that can uh, sort of silt up rivers. Uh, so we want to treat our wastewater so we don't contaminate downstream drinking water supplies. And again, we can use the same techniques, settling tanks, to settle out particles that we talked about before. But when we start talking about the dissolved organics, it tends to be fundamentally different from these humic substances. It's fresh organic material. So here is the generic formula for life. Uh, some guy back in the 50s looked at what the uh, elemental formula for various algae was and came up with this thing called the red field ratio. But it pertains to us, uh, some minor differences. But uh, basically, your carbon-rich CHO is basically this ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 is about the ratio of sugar. And then you have traces that you need of nutrients, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Now, the reason why sewage is important is because when you dump it in a, uh, in a river or some sort of uh, uh, ecosystem, it serves as a food supply. It is bioavailable. It's fresh organics. It serves for a food supply for bacteria. So bacteria tend to be carbon limited. And when you dump a load of food in, in a system, you can have bacterial blooms. So you have this population explosion of bacteria. And bacteria can eat that food, consuming oxygen just like we do. So when we eat food, we burn it with oxygen and, and form carbon dioxide and water. And the reason why this is important is that if we're looking as we go down a river, say here's the sewage discharge, we have a certain amount of dissolved oxygen in our water. But as we go down the river, bacterial blooms happen, chewing up the oxygen in the water supply. And eventually, after they've chewed up all the food, as the water continues to travel downstream, you get some aeration again. But it's, oxygen is very difficult to dissolve in water. It takes a very slow process. But in this region of the river, you might not have enough oxygen, and you end up with a bunch of fish kills. So this used to be fairly common sites. You still see this in certain areas of, say, up near Wallingford on the Quinnipiac. You'll have some dams, and there's some uh, leaking raw sewage that comes into the Quinnipiac up there. And you start to get some of these fish kill areas. So if you look around at some of the small dams up there, you'll see a bunch of dead fish lying around. But we treat wastewater for the most part now, so it's less of a problem than it used to be. Uh, so what other problems can sewage cause? So this relates both to groundwater and also just to natural systems like marshes. Uh, as I said, oxygen enters systems with difficulty. So let's think about uh, bacteria for a minute. Bacteria have certain enzymes that allow them to burn food, like us, using oxygen. But there are various other categories of organisms that instead of using oxygen, can use things like nitrate, iron, 
sulfate, or even fermentative organisms. And the difference between these is the energy per unit of food that they get out of this reaction. So we, like certain aerobic bacteria, tend to be the most efficient. We get the most energy per unit of food. Up here, nearly 3,000 kilojoules per mole. The other guys tend to be less efficient. So life out there is a competition. There's a limited supply of food, and all these bacteria could be out there together. But the ones that make the most energy per unit of food that they happen to get have more energy to reproduce. So they expand at the expense of these other organisms. And so where there's plenty of oxygen around on the Earth's surface or where we happen to live, uh, we uh, tend to find aerobic bacteria. As soon as you consume all the oxygen, because it's difficult to get into solution, some of these other guys can start thriving. And so here's an example of a house. You might have a septic tank with a leaching field. This is raw sewage partially treated, that starts to seep down into your groundwater system and eventually can come out to a well over here and be used as a drinking water supply. Well, you're loading up the system with food, so you're going to start this competition going, and oxygen takes a long time to diffuse down to that groundwater system. So first, the aerobic organisms are going to chew up all the oxygen, and then as that food starts passing through the groundwater, you're going to run out of oxygen. These other guys are going to start forming. So uh, what effects might that have? Uh, we need a, our audience volunteer here for a second. We have a special, an olfactory specialist. So just we uh, had to have an adult do this because uh, this is a toxic gas, hydrogen sulfide. So just so you know, you don't sue me. I'll do the same. See, I didn't die. So what does that smell like? Rotten eggs. Rotten eggs. So that's what hydrogen sulfide smells like. So, uh, well, I might have you come back in a second because we're going to treat this water. Um, so it looks relatively clear. I already loaded it with hydrogen sulfide. So that's that reaction right there, H2S. Uh, but we also, before that happens, we can reduce iron to iron 2. And I brought some of that here. And we're going to see what happens in a marsh, for example. Load a little bit of this in here. Kept it capped because we didn't want oxygen to leak in here. Get some, iron, some reduced iron, dump it in here. We'll shake it up to mix it. Hopefully this will work. We have iron 2 and sulfide. Worked right before. Having some trouble dissolving. I should do this. We'll add in some more. What's going to happen here is we're going to precipitate iron sulfide solids, if this works, to bring the right salt. Oops, I'm going to drop the pH too low. So you, so you could smell it. But if we force the system, it will eventually happen. I have to add a, a lot of this stuff, though. <laughs> Hopefully this will work. I did this right before I got here, and it worked like a charm. But uh, I guess what I'm getting at here is if you happen to go out to a marsh, um, say you're out digging for clams or something like that, if you look at the surface of the mud, it tends to be aerobic because you have uh, tides and uh, waves crashing. And so there's plenty of oxygen there. But if you dig down, you have an immense amount of carbon loading in sediments. Uh, so as you dig down, you'll see that the sediment quickly turns dark black. Um, Sometimes it happens within a millimeter. So what's happening there is, if I can get this thing to work, is you're precipitating iron sulfide, which is uh, highly, which is colored black. Hmm, I might have to add two, the whole bottle to this. So I, I jacked the pH down because what happens is hydrogen sulfide is an acid, H2S. And if it's HS minus, you can't smell it because a charged substance has to stay in water. 
So I wanted you to be able to smell it, but I just threw in some hydrochloric acid there to lower the pH, but that tends to uh, drive the dissolution of the mineral. I was hoping it, I didn't overdo it, but apparently I, I did. Let's see if we can get this. Actually, this has to work. All right, well, we had a little base. We could correct this. But I'll try one more. If not, I'll show you the, uh, at least the treatment technique and what, what happens there. Yeah. Ah, well, it would be too small to see, but there was a little kernel of it at the top. All right, well, I'm not going to be able to, to get this. But we will treat this water nonetheless. So we're going to take chlorine, so we're going to reoxidize it to the iron 3 form and the sulfate form, and then we'll see if it still smells. And we'll also see another effect that happens. Hopefully that will work. So what's happening? Turning orange. And let's make sure that uh, your nose isn't offended. So, uh, well, let me shake it up a little bit. So that comes to this point here. When you leave your house for a long period of time, sometimes you turn on your faucet and it turns red. What you're seeing is rust, iron 3 formation. And if you oxidize iron, it turns red, which is the color of rust. We've done that here. And let me see. So much better? So they treated our water. But it looks nasty, but it's completely harmless. Rust does not hurt you. It's just unsightly, right? Who wants to drink red water? Hydrogen sulfide, on the other hand, is not good for you. All right. So we can force these systems to generate hydrogen sulfide, reduced iron. Reduced iron is more soluble. It gets pulled up in your well and comes out your tap. And then when you leave for several months, oxygen slowly seeps into your taps and reoxidizes it to rust, which precipitates out as this nasty red solid in the toilet. Uh, and if you really force a system, you can get fermentation of organisms where you can produce things like methane or natural gas, marsh gas. OK, uh, let me, uh, what do I do with this? Here. So what else do we have? Uh, so what's the solution to this organic loading? Well, basically what we do is just duplicate what nature does. So remember, you force the system, you start depleting oxygen in, in rivers, and you get these fish kills. So what we do is just take the natural process and do it in a tank outside the river, speed it up, get rid of, have the microorganisms chew up all the uh, oxygen and the dissolved organics, and then pass the, uh, the organic free water out into a river. So you have a giant box, you bubble in oxygen, and you fill that box with bacteria, and then you settle the bacteria out and recycle them back into the process. And then what goes out is clean water that you disinfect. So the, the overall scheme for wastewater treatment is you have raw sewage comes in, you settle out particles just like for drinking water treatment. You run it through this system up here, which is referred to as activated sludge, where you're aerating the system and allowing bacteria to chew up the food, the dissolved food. You settle the bacteria out and recycle it and then chlorinate it and then dump it and dechlorinate because you don't want to kill any fish and send it out to rivers. So one other issue with that is all the stuff is settling out. You, you also get rid of some of the dead bacteria. What do you do with all those solids? It's a tremendous issue for wastewater treatment. Disposal is expensive and you pay by weight. You have to truck all this material off to say a landfill perhaps. Uh, and so what we use is some, a process called anaerobic digestion. You essentially want to reduce the amount of biomass you have in the system uh, by taking advantage of the fact that anaerobic organisms tend to be much less efficient than aerobic organisms. So per unit of food, they have much less energy coming out of the system, so they can't devote a lot of energy to reproduction. They just use that energy to stay alive. So you slowly chew down the bulk of your, your mass, uh, and in the process, you also generate methane. So you generate methane. If you go by North Haven towards Home Depot, uh, you'll see as you're passing over a bridge there on the right, you might see a site similar to this, a little flare going off. Well, that's uh, biosolids from the North Haven wastewater treatment plant uh, generating methane. And you flare off the methane because you don't want to have natural gas leaking out of the system. But 
these days, with energy being so expensive, it makes sense to capture that energy and use it to power the plant. So New Haven just got a system to capture it, a turbine, and generate about 35% of the energy used in the plant just using the methane that bubbles off. After all this digestion, you end up with something called cake, chocolate cake. Tastes pretty good. Uh, but you can use this. It contains nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, all the elements you need for successful fertilizer. So this ends up being essentially free fertilizer, just like night soil was back in the 1800s, for farmers. And so here you have these machines flinging biosolids out on agricultural fields. What are some of the emerging issues in wastewater treatment? Well, by activated sludge, we handled the carbon loading and removed the limiting uh, nutrient for bac bacterial growth. But algae don't need carbon. They make their own by photosynthesis. But they do need, this is a generic formula for, for life, they are limited by nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, so nitrogen and phosphorus exists in sewage because it's fresh organic material, and it fuels algae blooms. So you get these algae blooms up on the surface. Here's a picture of, some, of China. Uh, this showed up in the Olympics recently. If you remember, they were trying to have an aquatics competition in a lake that looked like this, and they had to quickly get rid of all the algae. Same thing happens in Long Island Sound. When you're at the beach, you see these large lettuce leaf, nasty looking algae. Well, that's from all the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus loadings into Long Island Sound. The surface is fine because you're photosynthesizing, so you're generating loads of oxygen. So it can actually be super saturated in oxygen. But these algae eventually die, sink to the bottom, and then the bacteria have now a food supply. So they chew up the oxygen, and your, your bottom waters go anaerobic, leading to fish kills. So there's a major effort now for uh, Connecticut and New York to try to introduce new treatment processes to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater so that you prevent this process and hopefully cut down on those lettuce leaf algae you see at the beach. One of the other emerging issues is the emerging global water shortage. So most people now think that, uh, that oil is the major issue or fuel is the major environmental issue these days. And of course, it is an important issue. But probably as or more important an issue is water shortages. And here's some uh, various pundits. We have a former VP of the World Bank saying, if the wars of the 21st century were fought over oil, the wars of the next century will be fought over water. So we're running out of water, and it's occurring both in, in the industrialized world, where oil, of course, is a problem, but also in the developing world, where a lot of people don't even notice fuel shortages. They're completely off the grid. We'll talk about some of that at the end. But an example here is California. So You've seen pictures of Los Angeles. It looks like lush palm trees. But in reality, it was founded in a desert. And so to supply that major uh, metropolis, they've been piping water into the city from various parts of uh, the West. Subject of the movie Chinatown was the Los Angeles Aqueduct, where they piped the entire Owens River to LA. They then built the Colorado Aqueduct, where a major fraction goes to LA and San Diego. Uh, but also Las Vegas and Arizona are now fighting over this water supply. And uh, until recently, there were, there were years when no water actually reached the Gulf of California. It didn't even reach Mexico. Mexico is supposed to get some by treaty, so they're uh, sort of cutting back on the amount that LA can get. And Northern California rivers have been piped down, California aqueduct. In all of these cases, the federal government is cracking down on this uh, process of importing water to LA ecosystem issues up in San Francisco, the fact that water doesn't even reach uh, the Gulf of California and treaty obligations with Mexico, plus Vegas and Arizona are also growing and they're fighting for the water. Uh, so for all, and uh, the EPA is forcing LA to at least leave some water in a lake that they drained to build this aqueduct. For all these reasons, LA is running out of water. And this, this issue is mimicked in other states, uh, Arizona and Florida. And so, can you import more water, or should you start using what little groundwater is natively present in LA by recycling wastewater? So what concerns would you have about recycling wastewater? Well, one of the big ones that has appeared in the news recently are what's all in wastewater, all of our consumer products, pharmaceuticals, hormones, uh, things like antibiotics, so antibacterial or antimicrobial hand soaps, for example, have triclosan and other sorts of antibiotics in there. And some of the concerns uh, might be, well, if you're dumping this out in ecosystems on a continuous basis, 
if it passes through your wastewater treatment plant, are you developing resistant pathogens? Some people would argue yes, some people would argue no, it's not really known at this point. Uh, another issue is, is something called endocrine uh, system disruptors. So in your endocrine systems, hormones at ridiculously low concentrations set off catalytic cascades when they reach a receptor in a cell. So tiny concentrations can have huge effects. And part of the problem is, is that some molecules uh, look or behave like the, the hormones that we use and can set off these sort of catalytic cascades. Uh, so a, one of the current concerns are, uh, this is the female reproductive hormone, 17 beta estradiol. Birth control pills, all they've essentially done is modified one functional group on the molecule so that your body can't deactivate it. So hence you can control birth. The problem is, is that this tends to persist during wastewater treatment and there are unknown issues about what happens if it ends up out in the ecosystem or ends back up in a drinking water supply. There's a lot of public outrage over this, and this has shut down a lot of wastewater recycling processes in California and the desert southwest, but as yet there's no demonstrated human health effects. And to a certain extent, this might make sense. If you're eating milligrams of dosage of pharmaceuticals, what's the chance that the nanograms per liter that end up ending up back in drinking water supplies or the micrograms per liter up to a million times less, thousand to a million times less, are going to have an effect on you. So it's as yet unknown. Uh, so what do people do for recycling wastewater? As I said, U.S. population is exploding in places like California, the desert southwest, Texas, and Florida, and there just isn't enough water there to support it. So already there are lots of wastewater recycling plants down there. The earliest example is a place called Water Factory 21 in Orange County, south of L.A. And uh, what they do, or officially say they, they're doing, is preventing seawater intrusion. So you're pumping out groundwater to use as, as drinking water, and the problem is, is that you're drawing water towards the well, and you're right next to the ocean. So you might start drawing salt water into your well. Uh, and once it's there, it tends to be fairly dense, so it's hard to get uh, it out again. So what they say is, well, well, we'll use it as drinking water, recycle the wastewater, and then pump it back into uh, right near the edge of the salt water to try to push that salt water wedge back towards the coast. And that was the official talk, and then people started to catch on, well, actually, this wastewater is eventually going to come right back out your drinking water well, so you're indirectly reusing wastewater. So it became a concern. People are concerned about hormones and pharmaceuticals. And so how might you treat this wastewater? Well, one way is a process called reverse osmosis. So naturally, if you have a, a membrane that only passes water and you have a high salt solution on one side, uh, your water is going to want to rush in to dilute that system. If you push down on that, you can force the system the other way. So if we have, uh, for example, uh, clean, we have clean water on one side and wastewater on the other side, we're, we're going to want to draw the clean water into the wastewater, but if you push hard enough, you can clean up the wastewater and only pass very clean water out the other side. So people use reverse osmosis in these indirect potable reuse operations to clean the water. But it's extremely energy intensive, so it's not done for typical wastewater treatment. And actually, the water can be so clean that, that there's talk about adding back in nutrients, like calcium for bone growth and that sort of thing. There's essentially nothing in the water. So that's planned uh, indirect potable reuse, and, but this is starting to bring up concerns that people hadn't thought about before for traditional wastewater treatment. If these molecules, pharmaceuticals and that sort of thing, are heading out into, uh, if they make it through wastewater treatment, we generally dump that in rivers. And these are endocrine disruptors, and organisms are equally susceptible to these hormone actions. So for example, salmon use estrogen-like hormones during spawning, the female will give off an estrogen-like uh, chem uh, chemical, and the male sa salmon will follow that trace upstream to figure out where the female is dumping its eggs, so it knows to show up and fertilize the eggs. But the problem is, is that uh, the pheromones that the salmon use is active at 10 to the minus 12th molar, and in wastewater effluents, you have birth control pill type uh, concentrations at two orders of magnitude higher concentrations. So the concern is, are the fish basically hanging out in the wastewater effluent rather than moving up to where the salmon are? Another issue is feminization of fish and amphibians, organisms that live in water. Will male, or what are supposed to be male, uh, fish and, and frogs, 
see a lot of these uh, female hormones and start to become feminized. So here's an example of atrazine, which is a pesticide in one of these endocrine disrupting compounds. And this is a frog gonad, and people have taken cross sections through it. And you see that this frog has both testes, the male organism, uh, and ovaries in the same frog. So this is starting to bring about a new way that we think about water and wastewater treatment, a new paradigm. We used to look at rivers and say, well, it's not rotting anymore because we have wastewater treatment, so it's relatively clean. So we can use that as our source water for our city. And yes, we generate uh, wastewater, but hopefully we dump it out close to the ocean. And the ocean's a big place. It'll, it'll handle it. But what we're now starting to realize is that there are towns upstream that are doing this process. And downstream, you may be bringing some of this material into your city. So Pittsburgh's upstream of Cincinnati. So Cincinnati is drinking partially diluted Pittsburgh uh, treated wastewater. What are some of the other effects? Uh, well, I was going to briefly talk about some of the stuff that we study. Again, we talked about pristine waters. And you have humic substance materials that you chlorinate and make various chlorinated byproducts. And these sort of disinfected waters have been associated with bladder cancer. When you're dealing with fresh organic material, you have a lot more nitrogen and phosphorus in the material. And so you might form different types of byproducts. In fact, you form chemicals called nitrosamines, which were the carcinogens identified in the 1970s in hot dogs and beer. And they tend to be 1,000 times more carcinogenic than chloroform. And they're uniquely associated with wastewater. So for example, we can take one of these green algae-infested lakes and chlorinate it, and we form small amounts of these nitrosamines. When we take a wastewater effluent and do it, we form orders of magnitude more. And so this has become a major issue for wastewater recycling plants because this, some of these molecules are very small and pass through RO reverse osmosis membranes. They're known carcinogens, so there's no issues about, well, are the pharmaceuticals or hormones really uh, disadvantageous for humans? And to get rid of them, you use very high energy intensive UV beams to try to blast the molecule after it's formed. So to give you a local spin on things, what we did was look at our Quinnipiac River watershed and, and sample the four wastewater treatment plants along the river. And Southington, Cheshire, Meriden, Wallingford, North Haven, and, and we're down here. And we went along the river and sampled the river and looked for the precursor material, the organic precursors of these molecules as they accumulate down the river. So Southington, you essentially have none, pristine above there. And then as you go down, you're slowly accumulating these precursors from the wastewater outfalls. We also looked at the percentage of the river that was actually wastewater as you proceed down the river. So we're in a relatively wet area. In, in places like LA, some of those rivers that show up on chips, you know, those old TV shows those where they always have motorcycle races, that's essentially 100% wastewater. Those are things like the San Gabriel River. Uh, but in, in the east, we tend to think we have a lot of natural water. Well, up in this is the spring season where you have high flows. You start with about 5% wastewater downstream of Southington. But by the time you get to Wallingford, it's about 20% wastewater. During the summer, in August, you have lower uh, flows helping dilute this. And you can be up to about 40% wastewater by the time you get to, to Wallingford, treated wastewater. So again, uh, mentioned that. Uh, Chlorinated waters are associated with bladder cancer, both in tap water and in pools. I wanted to briefly show you some stuff we've been doing in pools. So why are pools interesting? So we're looking at sewage loadings. And pools are an interesting case because you're swimming essentially in your own waste, right? You have a lot of sweat. And, and yes, people do pee in the pool. And you're disinfecting it also with chlorine. So we looked at the concentrations of uh, these nitrosamine carcinogens. Uh, in various types of pools. So we look at outdoor pools. And this, these, as we mentioned, you can use UV to destroy this chemical. So you have sunlight that can blast away this chemical. Indoor pools, where you don't have this effect. And hot tubs, where higher temperatures promote reactions. And so you start at somewhere around 6 nanograms per liter for outdoor pools. You jump up to about 30 nanograms per liter for indoor pools. And extremely high concentrations for hot tubs. You have to look at this axis for that. To give you an idea, the drinking water concentration regulations for these nitrosamines are down in this level, so you know, fairly high levels. Just for some local flavor here, we looked at the Yale uh, practice pool, which is an indoor pool, but they use a combination of UV and chlorine to disinfect. And you have levels that are much lower 
sort of comparable to an outdoor pool because you have UV disinfection. This is the penguin tank at the Mystic Aquarium. And it's an outdoor pool, so you, one would think it'd be over here. But actually, you're up near 100, about an order of magnitude higher. And again, the one reason why, penguins are essentially swimming in their own waste, right? They, they don't go to the bathroom in, in the bathroom. They go right in the pool. So a lot more precursors. What about bottled water? So you might think with all this talk, why don't I just drink bottled water? Isn't that safer? And so here you have CNN articles talking about Aquafina actually being required to spell out that oftentimes these bottled waters are simply tap water stuck in a bottle where they dechlorinate it so you don't taste uh, any disinfectant. So what's up with bottled water? Uh, as I said, sort of read the bottle carefully because about 30% of the market is glorified tap water. An example is Aquafina. Another issue is who's regulating this? Who's really looking out for the health of your water? The EPA regulates tap water, and that's sort of their specialty. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regulates bottled water. You can imagine that what they're looking for are the health of drugs in humans, and bottled water is sort of a distraction. So they're not, they don't spend a lot of time looking at what's in bottled water. How about cost? Tap water is less than a cent per gallon. Bottled water, if you were to sum this up to a gallon, would be about $5 a gallon, so extremely expensive. And lastly, there was a recent news article about bisphenol A, a plasticizer. Uh, these are all plastic bottles. It leaches out of these plastic bottles. And bisphenol A is one of these endocrine disrupting compounds. So if you think about it, many of you may have noticed this. You stick your bottle of water in the car, and it heats up, and you have that sort of plastic taste. What is that? Well, stuff leaching out of the plastic. So is that better? I would think not. The other issue is, Huge amount of plastic waste generated a year, one and a half million tons. So tap water, people don't like the taste of tap water because of the chlorine, but if you want to sort of stop that, there's an easy way. Squeeze a little lemon in there. Ascorbic acid is vitamin C, and it's used in the lab to quench chlorine. You get rid of the chlorine taste, and you can get a little bit of vitamin C extra. Uh, so developing world, just want to finish with this and some of the things we do here. Engineers Without Borders for some of the undergrads. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, in the developing world, all these issues are of paramount importance because people are literally living in their own waste. Uh, oftentimes, people are drinking partially diluted raw sewage uh, is what it comes down to. And so there are huge health issues. One and a half billion cases, a major fraction of the world has ascaris, for example, at any one time. An example is Mexico City. They have this river called the Grand Canal, which is essentially you know, Mexico City's... Uh, about 20 million people, all their raw sewage gets conveyed up in an in a, uh, artificial river to the northern state where it's used by farmers for irrigation who are, are, of course, exposed to all these pathogens. Another sort of graphical example, this is Cambodia again. And here we have a, a river. Where do you think the bathroom is? Right here. So it goes right down the river. Let's follow it downstream. And we have this sort of mat of nasty trash. And what's right here? A homemade sort of uh, water distribution system, all made out of bamboo. It's very interesting. Little water wheel. You convey the water up. It pour, pours into a bamboo slot and goes right into someone's house. But what are they drinking? So this is very common throughout the world. We went down uh, recently to Honduras, uh, and a town of about 1,000 people, totally off the road, dirt roads, no power. And they, they already had a spring box to collect water. They used to, in the old days, drink out of a contaminated stream. But they'd already had a spring box installed to collect clean water. The problem is, is Hurricane Mitch came through and destroyed the system. No relation. But uh, flow dropped by about 70%. So we went down there to try to help them out. So you have a spring up in the hills. It conveys water. To, they already had this distribution system to convey it down to a concrete storage tank and distribute it throughout various villages. And the types of things we do is measure things like flow rates of various uh, contributors to the spring, oftentimes with local materials. This is just a palm leaf to help convey the water in and measure flow rates. Test the health of the water. Are there bacteria in the water? Measure pressures in taps located around the town to see how, if you have major leaks, you can tell because you'd see a drop in pressure. Survey the system to figure out everything. There's no power here, so everything has to be done by gravity flow. So we use surveying to actually tell us the relative elevations of areas and where you can uh, convey water by gravity. And what we found is that you have a spring box here, so 
material leaches out from the hillside and it fills up a concrete box and then it's conveyed down to the village. But Hurricane Mitch had eroded out the bottom of this box and so water was seeping around and filling up. They had an old dam here so you had sort of surface water here and pigs were wallowing in the surface water. So it was sort of contaminated water. They, they weren't drinking this water but still a major source of the water that would have gone through here ended up here. So we wanted to capture that in some way. So our idea here was basically leave their existing drinking water system. Don't mess with it because they rely on that on a daily basis, but they were getting much less water and having to ration. And instead, try to capture this water out front that had leaked around and formed a surface water. And so what we envision here is here's this surface water. We're going to dump into the uh, trench here slotted PVC pipe to let it, the water seep, seep into the pipe. And then we're going to submerge it with sand and plant plants on it so that uh, pigs don't have direct access. They're not saying, hey, this is my drinking water supply. I'm going to go root around in this, this uh, saturated soil here. We keep it, the pigs away by just putting in natural soil, collect it in a box, and convey that down to the village. And so we put in the slotted pipe here in that trench, filled it with sand and gravel. And so you see uh, we finally tied into another pipe that went down to the village. And the villagers do a lot of the work along with us. Uh, and the system worked. And it, the last thing I want to show you is something really cool, I thought, that we saw. We didn't necessarily do this, but another group was down there looking at uh, local applications for anaerobic digestion. So remember, we were talking about North Haven and New Haven capturing methane gas coming off of the biosolids. Well, uh, one of the major problems in developing countries is, again, also lack of fuel, because people use wood to cook food for the most part. And so they're deforesting a lot of the area. And then as population grows, they're just trees don't grow fast enough. So people are looking for alternative fuel systems. And you have cattle walking around with cow pies. So why not use that as fuel? And it helps clean up the town at the same time. So what you have here is a, essentially a hefty bag, glorified hefty bag, a little hole sort of wrapped around it. And this is proceeding downhill. And the woman in this house would come out every day and throw the cow pies in this hole, add a little water to wash it down. But it's, it's isolated away from the air, so it starts to rot. You start generating methane. And this was all a locally rigged system. You have the methane gets collected. It comes up this pipe. Here, here's the same pipe. comes over. You regulate the pressure with a Coke bottle so the, the little uh, pipe sits down in water. And so that it, you need more pressure to have it sort of you can control and make sure you don't blow up the system by having too much methane because it will have to overcome a certain amount of pressure to come down through the bottom of the water. But if, if you have too much pressure, it will start to bubble out. And then it conveys uh, further into the system and is used to heat, uh, to, to cook her food. Clean natural gas. And with one cow, she gets about two hours worth of cooking time a day. And no hassle with you know, starting a fire, collecting the wood. Just goes out and throws a cow pie in here. Uh, so that, that was basically all I had. So be happy to take any questions.